Church, good morning again. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I don't know what things stand out in your mind each Easter day. As a child, there were always two things that stood out in my mind every Easter. The first is, yay, it's happy Easter. We all celebrate. But even better, yay, my happy birthday is just around the corner. It's a super duper happy day and all of that. But as I gave more thought to it, since I get to think about it every year, I realized that the happiness of Easter is much better than the happiness of a birthday. Why? Because on a birthday, you celebrate the day when you were born. It was a fresh start. Your life started in this, in this world with so many possibilities wrapped up into the tiny body. It was unbroken, undefiled, no regrets, no hurt. But as life progresses, there is so much brokenness that meets you. There are so many moments that you regret. There are things that you do wrong that perhaps you could make right. But there are also things that others could do to you that might just feel beyond repair. Birthday, how much ever happy it is, it cannot do anything to all of this brokenness. It can maybe numb these for a day, but not beyond that. Easter, on the other hand, is not a mere celebration of something good and happy, but it's a celebration of the undoing of everything that is broken, every hurt that ravaged you, every regret that evokes guilt and shame. Easter is a celebration not just of triumphing, tri triumphing of good triumphing over evil, it is the complete annihilation of anything evil, including the greatest evil, death. Christ has risen from the dead and he destroyed the deadly sting of death itself. He is risen indeed. Come, let us worship him. Let us hear the call to worship. Call to worship is from Psalm 30. You have turned our mourning into dancing. You have taken away our funeral clothes and reclothed us in joy so that our whole being, body, mind, and soul might sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, our Lord, we will give thanks to you forever. Come, let us worship the risen King. Amen. Church, let's all sing together. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Hallelujah. Follow 
bowing our exalted head. Alleluia. Made like Him, like Him we rise. Alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, our great and awesome God. We, glory, we glorify you for your almighty power that raised Jesus Christ from his death. Lord Jesus Christ, who won the victory and rose again from death, thank you for your great love and sacrifice. We thank you for giving us a hope of everlasting life and salvation through your cross and resurrection. O oh Lord, risen, alive, and full of grace, you paid such a price that we may live in freedom today. Thank you, Jesus. We worship your holy name and give thanks for your redeeming grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stars of grace from the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him where steady on some mercy reach to get the children in. sing it out rejoice rejoice let Christ rejoice. Come those whose joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battle wounds and those struggling the fight. For his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease but follow us through all our days with the certain hope of peace rejoice 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 let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice oh church of Christ And all from every land, men and women of the faith, come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of His grace. Over all the world, His people see, shore to shore, we hear them call. The truth that Christ through every age, our God. Amen. Rejoice. Christ is risen. 
the event of resurrection is the most unique thing perhaps about Christianity. And the promise of resurrection that this event brings is a promise that nothing else beats. And the reason why this promise of resurrection and this event of resurrection are so special is because without the resurrection, what religion would tell us is that you should set your lives right, you should leave your sin behind and come to God. But resurrection tells us that no, as you bring your brokenness to Jesus, he undoes everything that is broken. He undoes every power of sin and shame that can bind you. And that is the power of resurrection because of which we come to Jesus. And friends, today we come to Jesus with the same, with the same hope that he will undo everything that's broken, everything that is hurt, everything that is awful about our sinful lives. So as you come to him, come with confidence. Come confessing your sin and shame. Let's come confessing our sin and shame publicly together. And then we'll have the opportunity to confess our sin and shame privately to Jesus, who will undo every sin and brokenness. Let's confess our sin and shame. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are people who often live our lives in routine but who rarely enter into the fullness of the abundant life. In Easter, you accomplished the impossible. You proved your word and your faithfulness with the remarkable power of the resurrection of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. We, however, live as though the tomb was not empty. Forgive us for not walking in the light of your love. Forgive us for doubting that your word is reliable and true. Forgive us for refusing to believe that you would do what you promised. As we confess our sins and doubts, we also affirm that through the cross, you have conquered these once and for all. May we live abundantly in the power that raised Jesus from the dead. We pray humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's take a moment now to confess our sin and shame privately to the Lord. Repenting believers, hear the words of assurance from the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And God's people respond saying, thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, let's also affirm our faith uh, of, ab about the risen Lord and what he has done for us. I'm reading from Romans chapter 6, verses 8 to 11. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. 
but the, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus and God's people respond. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, this, uh, th this costly love that has come to us has laid down its, its own life so that you and I may have eternal life. And as a response to this, we respond to him in gratitude, in worship. And now we have the opportunity to respond to Jesus' love uh, through our financial giving. What you give goes towards the work of the church so that the work of the gospel may, be, uh, may progress within our city and elsewhere. So take this time to, uh, to bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord. Uh, the, uh, the account details, uh, you, can, uh, you can get them from us. They are posted in the chat board. Uh, also, uh, if you're in the practice of giving uh, physically uh, by setting aside some money every week, please feel free to do that. And when we gather together uh, again as a gathered body, you can bring them uh, and put them in the offertory bag. Uh, take this time to worship the Lord through your giving. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope great mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross is spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe 
out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on It's great on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living home Hallelujah, hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me You have broken salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ my living hope God you are my living hope Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter to you all. He is indeed risen, and I am so grateful to be rejoicing in that wonderful truth with you all today, even if not in person. Um, before I begin with announcements, I'd like to invite our city kids to hop off this Zoom call and onto their own link, which has been provided in the WhatsApp group. Um, and yeah, goodbye, city kids. Um, so last week we wrapped up our sermon series known as Elect Exiles, and we are moving into a new series titled The Law of Love next week. We'll be studying how God reveals his character through the Ten Commandments, and if you want to, you can read a little bit more about that series in the ROG. Um, this week we also have our monthly prayer meeting on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on Zoom. Um, we would love for you all to join us, and the link for that will be sent out soon. For anyone visiting us this morning, anyone who's new, um, we I want to especially welcome you to our Easter service. We're so thankful that you chose to rejoice with us this morning. Um, if you have a brief moment between now and the end of this Zoom call, if you could fill out um, just a short form that's shared in the chat box, we would love to have your information so that we can reach out and get to know you a little better. Um, and if you've been coming to NCF for some time now um, and you'd like to know more about who we are as a community, what we believe, and also maybe what membership looks like, um, we have a course called NCF Explored. Um, we're offering it in three parts on April 10th, 17th, and 24th. Um, those are Saturdays, I believe, from 3 to 5 p.m. So you can register for that course now on our website. Um, and for those of us who are members of NCF, um, as we discussed in the congregational meeting, uh, we do have an upcoming vote regarding the presbytery that NCF will belong to. If you have any questions regarding this, please do reach out to Rukshith or any of the elders um, and, and feel free to, to discuss this further with them. Um, finally, I know that many of us are feeling sad not to be meeting in person this week, um, especially um, this week, um, but we're hopeful that as the situation with the virus improves and as the government deems it safe to gather again, um, we are hoping that we can return to the joy of meeting in person. Um, we will be getting updates on the WhatsApp group uh, and on the website about services in the coming weeks based on government guidelines. Um, but in order for those in-person services to run smoothly, and in fact, even for our Zoom services in the meantime to run smoothly, we are really in need of volunteers for the various teams that are a part of setup and, um, and, and you know, just having the service run uh, on a Sunday morning. So please, please consider using your time and your gifts to serve NCF in this way um, and sign up using the form that is linked on the ROG. 
that is all I have for announcements this morning. So would you join me in praying for our community and our city? Lord, we gather on this beautiful morning so keenly aware of the price you paid for us to do so. The cost of our sin was great and heavy, yet you took it upon yourself and became sin so that we could approach your throne blameless. We live each day by your death and by your sacrifice. But we gather to rejoice this morning that you did not leave it there. You rose again victorious and put death to shame. That you invite us to know and live in that victory is mercy that is beyond comprehension. Thank you for this new life we have the joy and the certain hope that you offer us and the call to live a life worthy of this wonderful gospel truth. This morning, though, we grieve another Easter Sunday for which we are unable to meet and celebrate together in person. We thank you, Father, for your sovereignty in protecting us and our city. We know that even in our sadness, we can trust your perfect will for us. As new guidelines emerge, Lord, we thank you for the wisdom of our leaders. And we ask that you would give us, uh, give us hearts of obedience and discernment. As a new wave of cases moves through Bangalore and numbers are on the rise once again, give us the wisdom to consider the people around us, those whom you have called us to love and serve. And help us take all the care we can to reduce exposure in these coming weeks and months. As we yearn for togetherness, Lord, help us find ways to stay connected, to love and serve each other and be encouraged in the fellowship of saints as you have always intended for us. We know that even in these difficult times, your desires for us are good and perfect. And the hope we have in you, our redeemer and heavenly father is unparalleled. We come as your children, and as your chosen people and pray that you would have mercy on our city, protect its people and carry it safely through this time. It is in that great hope, Father, I also pray for those in our community who are facing difficult circumstances. I pray for those who are separated by loved ones and have been for the past year. I pray for those who are seeking employment and experiencing that uncertainty. I pray for those who are grieving, those who feel isolated. I pray that they would know your comforting presence closer than ever now and see your hand at work in their lives. I pray for Joshua and Anne, and especially for their mother, that they would experience your healing and they would recover to full strength. I pray for Vivek as he battles his recurring ailments and I thank you for the resources you've provided as he and Susan and their family face this difficulty. I pray for continued healing and continued clarity, Lord, and that we, their community, would strive to be an encouragement to their hearts. Father, it is your loving kindness that draws us near, so we may ask these things of you and trust you to answer. You hold all things together and work them so beautifully for our good. And even when all we can see is darkness, we know the truth and the goodness of your resurrecting power. You are worthy of praise and honor and glory, and we can rejoice with full hearts this morning, no matter what our circumstances, that our Lord is risen and he reigns. We pray these things in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. And now I invite the scripture reader to read our portion of scripture for this morning. Um, would you follow along with me? Um, today's scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 to 23. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have, been, who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. This is God's holy word. Good morning, friends. It is so good to gather online and worship Jesus um, on this Easter Sunday. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for joining us to uh, remember and celebrate the goodness of God in giving us Christ. Um, just as by way of uh, sort of housekeeping, uh, right after the service, if you can uh, stick around. Today is uh, Dhruvika's last Sunday with us. Uh, she is traveling and moving uh, to a new country. So if you can just uh, linger right after the benediction, uh, we, uh, we will celebrate God's faithfulness to us in giving us Dhruvika. And uh, thank her for her service and bless her on her way as, uh, as she seeks the Lord's will. Um, all right, it looks like my video is off. Now I'm on. Great. Um, so, um, yeah, stick around and uh, we'll remember and uh, thank Dhruvika for her service to Christ Church. So today is Resurrection Sunday, and truth be told, the reason we gather every Sunday is because Jesus has risen. Um, so every Sunday in that sense is a Resurrection Sunday. Uh, but in church calendar, we get to, um, at, at least once a year, almost exclusively focus on the resurrection of Christ itself, both in its uh, historic aspect, but also in what it means for us today. So before we go any further, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you for your word. We pray that you'll open our eyes to see Jesus Christ. We pray that you'll give all of us who are listening keen and attentive ears to hear and to feed upon Christ by faith. And that all of us will grow in our intimacy with him as a result of today's service, but particularly the preached word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine you uh, walked into your home after a vacation one day, and um, um, you see that the house is in a mess. It is not the way you left the house. The, the, the books are off the shelf, and um, 
the clothes uh, from the wardrobe are on the floor the the bed is messy and um i mean the fridge is open the drawers are open everything is in a is is a mess the house is a mess so you you quickly sort of run through possible scenarios where such a thing could have happened in all your uh, shock the first um option that could have come that could have come across your mind is that perhaps there was an earthquake uh, in bangalore while you were away and then you quit, you do some research you google it and you find out that actually the last time we that bangalore had an earthquake was back in 2001 but then you think of other options other explanations for all that all the mess that you're seeing the second option you come up with is that your neighbor's kids perhaps may have barged into the house. Perhaps you left the door open and you didn't realize it while you were away and the neighbor's kids came and uh, thought this was a huge playhouse and they decided to have fun there. And then you realize that actually there is not a neighbor, neighbor who has kids for about five kilometers. Um, and so that too falls short. It's it's unlikely that a neighbor that you don't know who has kids is going to travel five kilometers just to ransack your house. But then you have uh, you, you you come across a third explanation for what's happened. Um, uh, perhaps it's the real life Toy Story movie, you know, that everything in the house has life and none of the none of the objects in the house knew that you were going to show up at the time that you did. So they all just pretended to be lifeless uh, when you entered the house. It's possible. I mean, everything is possible. It's possible that we don't exist right now, but it's not reasonable, is it? It's not reasonable that, um, that your house is a real life Toy Story movie. But then you come with a fourth explanation. Perhaps there was a burglar who burgled your house who a thief who broke in and stole something and you're yet to figure out who or what it is. So you ask your neighbors what if they heard anything and one of them says, you know, actually three nights ago while you were away, there was a noise and we just thought it was a city noise and we went back to sleep and it could be that. And, and then you check the CCTV footage for that time and you and you see the burglars breaking into your house. You see, the best and most reasonable solution is one that explains all of the evidence. The Apostle Paul does something here for us today. He gathers all the evidence and then lays it before us as, ex as the best explanation and only explanation that fits all of the evidence for Christ's resurrection. So the, 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 we, we will look at today's passage um, by way of answering two questions. Firstly, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And secondly, does Jesus's resurrection really matter anyway? Firstly, then, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Well, according to Paul, he gives, he lays out five uh, witnesses, five testimonies, um, <clears throat> Uh, verifiable witnesses uh, to sort of confirm that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. Firstly, he says in verse 5 that he appeared to Cephas. This is Simon Peter. Remember the, the, the disciples um, on the road to Emmaus in, in Luke 24. Um, there, there, there's the witness of the disciples who are being um, uh, who are being ministered to by the risen Jesus Christ, and as he was breaking the bread to eat with them, they realized, "Oh my, this was perhaps the Jesus we have all been talking about all this time." And so they run to Jerusalem, go to the disciples, and when they go to the disciples, they hear the conversation and they say, "The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon." The risen Christ appeared to Simon. And then the second group of witnesses, if you will, are the 12. And actually, it starts off with the 11, you see, because Judas uh, Iscariot 
uh, died and killed himself uh, out of shame and embarrassment for betraying our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, Jesus appears to the 11 in Mark 16, where they're reclining at the table. Jesus rebukes their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw Jesus Christ after he was risen. And this is particularly the women who witnessed Jesus' resurrection. He rebukes them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. And then in the same chapter, he commissions them to go and make him known. And then in, in, later in Acts, uh, they try to find a replacement for Judas Iscariot to be the, the, a, a number of the 12. And one of the criteria, if you remember, was that such a person should have been an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And so Matthias fills the spot, the 12. So Jesus appears to the 12. And the, the third group, the third uh, group of witnesses or the third witness account is the 500 uh, people, the 500 brothers or really brothers and sisters because the, the word there is generic. There were 500 people to whom Jesus Christ appeared after he rose from the dead. Many have said perhaps that these are group hallucinations or group visions or group dreams, um, it, that it, it, they really did not see the risen Christ. But scientifically and psychologically, it's been proven that a group of people cannot be hallucinating the same thing in the same way at the same time um, in a way that seems real to all of them at once. Psychologically, it's proven that such a thing cannot exist. One of us could be hallucinating, perhaps in a group of 500 people, maybe a few of them could be hallucinating, but an entire group of people to be hallucinating it uh, is very, very unlikely. And so Paul says, Jesus appeared to 500 brothers and sisters. And then he goes on to name the fourth people he can, uh, fourth person or fourth witness that um, uh, who was an who was a witness of Jesus's resurrection, and that's James. This is James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, about the five hundred people, Paul says some of them are dead, but quite a few of them are still living. Paul says so. Go and verify for yourself. He tells the Corinthian church. Go and ask them what they saw. Verify and confirm for yourself. And then he names the fourth witness, James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember James uh, uh, speaking of the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the, the gospel accounts tell us that the family mocked him. His brothers and sisters did not believe him. They thought he was crazy. They thought Jesus was a lunatic. So for James to have um, to have gone from thinking that his brother is, or his half brother Jesus was was a lunatic, to actually proclaiming Jesus Christ as the only hope and savior of the world, something dramatic should have happened. And Paul says the resurrected Jesus Christ appeared to James, his half brother, and so was converted. And finally, finally, as a fifth witness, Paul names himself as one untimely born. Uh, the, the word there is uh, born in an unusual way, or perhaps even premature birth. It's the same word that's used for a, a miscarriage. You see, Paul is telling, speaking of himself um, as though he should have been there when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But it was only after Jesus' ascension to the heavens that the resurrected Jesus Christ personally appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. The Apostle Paul, he, is, he was perhaps the most ardent, young, energetic persecutor of the early church. He led a group of persecutors. In fact, he was on the way to Damascus to persecute the church of Christ. And you remember how Jesus Christ appears to this Paul and says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus responds, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. But Paul says, no, but it, it, it's not you, it's the church. But Jesus says, no, it's the same thing. They are my people. I am their head and they're my body. To persecute the body is to persecute the whole, um, whole being with Jesus Christ at its head. And so Paul says that as one untimely born, Jesus Christ appeared to him also. And he calls himself the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. He sees that he doesn't deserve the, the calling of an apostle. He doesn't deserve the grace of God in, in saving him. The, the, the radical conversion that Saul experienced made him one of the greatest preachers of the early church. What could have taken, what could have, what is it that could have made an ardent persecutor of the church of Christ? Perhaps the most zealous preacher and missionary of the early church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, according to Paul, the resurrection of Jesus Christ itself. So, so Paul lays out five witnesses, few individual and few group witnesses. Firstly, Peter. Secondly, the group of 12. Thirdly, the group of 500. Fourthly, the person of James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And fifthly, uh, Paul himself. And this is not to mention the several other accounts of the resurrected Christ appearing to the disciples um, on, the, uh, on, on Emmaus. And the, the several women that, he, that Jesus appeared to um, after his resurrection. So Paul names all of these witnesses. In ancient history, many first century and second century non-Christian uh, 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 historians confirm and affirm and acknowledge that Jesus Christ was indeed crucified and that he died and that he was buried. To, in today's um, a world we have two predominant resurrection historians, if you will, Gary Habermas and Mike Licona. And they mention five uh, verifiable evidence, evidences for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they build it as such. These are the bare facts, the minimum facts of history, openly acknowledged. Um, firstly, Jesus died on the cross and was buried. You remember uh, you, you, Jesus Christ, uh, when he was on the cross, the Roman guard thrust a spear to his side and water gushed out. And to the gospel uh, uh, accounts, uh, writers, this was spectacular that water gushed out of, uh, of the body. But you see, when someone is injured to the point of death, people suffer from circulatory shock. Because the organs and the body tissues are not receiving adequate blood flow. This can sometimes result in fluid accumulation around the membrane of, of the heart or the lungs. So when, when, when a person is thrust on the side, you can expect fluid, water to gush out. And it was an indicator that Jesus was dead. Roman guards actually would face death if anyone survived crucifixion. So they ensured that Jesus Christ was indeed dead. And then you have the, 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 the Jewish leaders who, who worked with the government to ensure there were enough soldiers to seal the grave shut and that there was, uh, that soldiers kept watch through the night because they were actually scared the disciples would come and steal the body and then claim that Jesus rose from the dead. It is precisely for that reason they placed, uh, they placed guards there. Secondly, Jesus' tomb was empty and no one ever produced the body. To this day, there is no evidence for the body of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, Jesus' disciples believed that they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. What do you expect? You, you know, I'm alive now. There's a time when I was born. And there will be a time when I would die. Uh, it'll be on my tombstone. 
But you see, with Jesus Christ, he was dead, and then there are evidences of his resurrection, and then he's gone. He disappears from historical record because he rose from the dead. Fourthly, Jesus' disciples were transformed following the resurrection observations. As we have seen even in this passage, people who, would, who were scared for their lives, Peter who, Peter who was scared for his life and who would deny the Lord Jesus Christ on the night of his crucifixion. This same Peter would be so bold as to proclaim the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And that he would be, he would lay his life down for the sake of his gospel. Thomas Arnold, a 19th century professor of history at Oxford, says that he wrote the three volume uh, history of, of Rome. He says this, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind, which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. All of this to say, Paul says, Jesus rose from the dead. And it's a historical fact. It is not make-believe. It is a historical fact. He wasn't just resuscitated only to later die like Lazarus. But he actually rose from the dead, never to die again. Jesus rose from the dead. So what, you may ask? So what if Jesus rose from the dead? Well, you see, according to the Apostle Paul, Jesus' historical resurrection has a theological and personal significance for the end of the world, for your life and mine. And that's the second question we'll try to address. Does Jesus' resurrection really matter? Does Jesus' resurrection really matter? In verse 4, we see that Jesus was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Earlier in verse 3, it says at the end of verse 3, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That Jesus died is indisputable. It's, a, it's an indis, indisputable fact of history that Jesus died. But that he died for our sins, that is a theological significance. That is of personal significance, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Jesus' death and resurrection is at the center of the gospel message. Do you see that in verse 1? Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. And what did that gospel message contain? What did, what did it comprise? It comprised of the historical death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of persons, for the salvation of individuals, for the salvation of his people. That is of personal significance. Jesus' death and resurrection is at the very center of the gospel message. Secondly, there is literally no lasting hope for humanity apart from Jesus's resurrection. Do you see that in verses 13 and 14? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Jesus's resurrection is simply make-believe stuff, if, if Jesus's resurrection is unverifiable even, by history, unlike if Jesus' resurrection is just like anyone's reincarnation myth, that each of us has a, a cycle that we are a part of, and we go over and over again through until we attain enough karma to be joined to the one, except 
that there is really no historical evidence for any such thing. Such a notion is unverifiable. No one is self-aware of the fact of who they were in the previous life, of whether they were a bug or a, or a human being or a dog or what they will be next in their life cycle. Such notions are unverifiable. But what Paul is saying is, because Jesus has indeed risen from the dead as a historical verifiable fact, so you too will rise again. But if Jesus has actually not risen from the dead, if it is not a historical fact, because you see some of the Corinthian believers did not actually, they were tempted to not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ for whatever reason. And Paul says, if Jesus actually did not rise from the dead, by the way, I, I know he did because I saw him, but if he really did not, our faith is futile. It's vanity. It's garbage. We might as well give up on Christianity altogether because it is of no eternal significance. There is literally no lasting hope for humanity apart from Jesus's resurrection. We are even found to be misrepresenting God like Paul if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Our gospel preaching is vanity. Our desire for holy living is of no use at all if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Above all, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, not only is our faith futile, we are still in our sins. There is no hope for you and me to be reconciled to God if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Elsewhere, Paul says Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again for our justification. He died for our sins and rose again to give a clean record to any who would come and trust in him to be reconciled to God. But you see, if Jesus Christ indeed did not rise from the dead, if he did not rise from the dead, we are not justified. We are still in our sin. We are still children of wrath. We are still haters of God. We are still enemies of God. We are still hostile to God. And we will eternally be condemned by God himself for all eternity in hell. If Christ did not rise from the dead, you and I are still in our sin. And we will die in our sin and pay the penalty for our sin for the rest of our eternal human existence. But, verse 20, in fact, in reality, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We can be confident that just as Christ has been historically raised from the dead, we will rise too. In verse 21, for as by a man that is Adam came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All will be made alive. If we know for a fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, historically, and we have placed our faith in this historic Jesus, in his historic resurrection, we have been justified by faith in him. We have been given a clean record because we trust in him. We have been saved from our sin because we have believed in his resurrection. Because our first father, Adam, plunged himself and all of us into Satan's tyranny and sin and death. 
But the second man, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, he lived the perfect life. His alone is the cleanest record available in human history. And for any who would come and trust in him, just as he rose from the dead historically, we will rise from the dead historically. We are waiting. We are only waiting. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And just as he has been raised, we will rise too. As we sang just a few moments ago, the work is finished. The end is written. All those who have trusted in Jesus Christ will rise like him in history, just as he himself rose in history. When we look back and see the risen Christ, and when we look up and see the risen Christ ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father, we are compelled to look forward into the future and look at our own resurrection itself. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits, what does that mean? Just as mango season is beginning and you go to, this, to the orchard and pluck a mango and you taste it and you feel the taste of it and you experience how sweet it is and how the, that first fruit that you have plucked is representative of all the mangoes in the orchard. So this Jesus Christ who has, who has risen from the grave is the first fruits that history has ever tasted of what the world will be, of what his people will look like on the final day of resurrection. We can look at this Jesus Christ as that first ripe fruit. And he is the representative of what we will be like. Have you wondered what the point of all this life is. Have you wondered the about the purpose of pain and suffering, no matter how small or how big you feel they are? Have you wondered if we will ever have a body that doesn't deplete in energy as you age? Have you ever wondered what life would be like if no one died? Have you wondered what life would be like with no conflict, with no hurt, with no bitterness to fight, no sinful nature in ourselves to fight against every day? Jesus Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection, is a representative of what we will be like free of sin. He is in perfect harmony with the Father. So we will be too with him and with each other when we are raised up on the last day. Just as he has risen, not res resuscitated, but risen from the dead once and for all historically, so we will rise again in history once and for all, never to die again forever. Just as this Jesus Christ is not getting older, his body is not depleting with energy over time. He is not facing another grave, another tomb. So we will be when we rise from the dead, just as Jesus was risen from the dead. We will grow perfect in Christ likeness. Unlike now when we are having to kill sin and aim towards holiness, laying aside sin unto holiness. But on that, on that day, just as Jesus himself now is perfect and with regards to his human nature is growing more and more fully 
into the infinite, perfect, holy nature of God. So we will be too on that day. Not from sin unto holiness, like we are today, but from holiness unto holiness, like Jesus. Jesus Christ is a representative of what we will be like. He's the first fruits of what we will be like if we have believed in him. Let me close with a few points of application. Firstly, if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, know that this future is only for those who belong to him. Do you see that in verse 23? But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. It is not for everybody to taste what Jesus has tasted in his resurrection. It is only for those who belong to Christ. My dear friends, do you belong to Christ? Do you belong to him? Do you know him? Do you love him? If you don't come now, repent and trust in him. Come and be known by this resurrected Jesus Christ who has died for the sins of the world and has been raised up for the justification of all those who will believe in him. Come and believe in him. Belong to this Jesus Christ today. For those of us who claim to believe and belong to this Christ, Notice what Paul says in, in the early part of chapter 15. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Preach the gospel to one another. Share the gospel message as often as you can with yourself and with everyone you meet, including those who are in the church of Christ. Speak of the gospel. Speak words of life. Secondly, hear it preached and receive it. Every week when you gather or every time your brother a brother or a sister from the congregation speaks the gospel message to you, receive it with faith, not with arrogance. Because it is the gospel message and not self-righteous people who are trying to speak their self-righteousness into you. It is the gospel message Receive it as such. Receive the message of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ for sinners, no matter where it comes from. Hear it preached, receive it, but also in which you stand, stand on it. Stand on it. Not, not the fleeting pleasures of the world, Stand on the gospel message. Don't act like you have a split personality disorder on Sundays to claim to stand on the gospel and on the rest of the week to claim to stand on something else. Or perhaps it is even when you come to Sunday services that you're really standing on something else and not on the gospel message. Hear the gospel preached, receive it and stand on the gospel message. Finally, he says, hold fast to it. Hold fast to the word I preach to you. Do not believe in vain. Hold fast. The, 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 the notion is one of having held on to it at one time, only to over time lose in the grip of the gospel message. And many have fallen away from the faith. Because they have not held fast to the gospel. So hear the word preached. Receive it. Stand on it. And hold fast to it firmly. As though your life depends on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come and belong to him. Come and hear the word preached. Receive the gospel preached. Stand on the gospel preached. And hold fast to the gospel preached daily. Jesus Christ has indeed risen from the dead. And it matters because it is tied to your 
personal story. Come and believe in him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that it is not a gospel where our Savior laid dead in the grave, but rather has been raised in victorious life, never to die again. And we thank you for making him the representative, not Adam, but Jesus Christ, the representative of all those who come and trust in him. I pray for each one of our hearers this morning that you will kick the boredom out of our souls and come and lay life eternal in each one of our hearts. Give us faith in Jesus Christ. Let your Holy Spirit unite us to Christ's death as well as his resurrection. We thank you for the gospel, O oh God of resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Rakshad. Our church, in response to the preaching of God's word, let us all sing together our last song, Is He Worthy?
made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of a blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Receive now the Lord's benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, or rather, there's a new one here. Let me use this. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And God's people respond. Thanks be to God. Amen.